Hi, welcome to Info Dumpies. My name is Brianne. I'm autistic. I have ADHD. My pronouns are she, her, and I've actually sold a lot of my photography, but only the ones where the subject was my own butt, so. Hi, my name is Violet. My pronouns are she, her. I have ADHD, and my favorite thing to photograph is boobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm aware yeah. of that. Yeah, it's a great subject. Also, butts, legs, women. Just women in general. Uh, but that's oh, why... yeah. Yeah, honestly. In general? Lots of them? Just... Well, I mean, just women in general are just great. Just great. Oh, okay. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, I have a favorite. Okay. With red hair and a mohawk. And I do a podcast with her called Infotomy. There's Mo- another one with the red hair and a mohawk. <laughs> oh, y- yes. Uh, her name is Bleanne. Uh, Bleanne Gleason. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, there's another woman uh, that I do podcasts with, and we do a podcast called F- Facto Dumpies. Uh, factor, factor, today, fact or dump. Today, today's lumpy wiener. Yeah, today, yeah, today's lumpy. <laughs> today's lumpy wiener is really good, actually. <laughs> um, just like rating dick pics that people have sent. <laughs> <laughs> today's lumpy wiener. Yeah. What today on our podcast? Today's Lumpy Wiener. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so today I want to talk about film photography. And I know I've talked a little bit about film before uh, in terms of like how color photography works. But today I want to talk specifically about film photography and kind of the resurgence of it in, in modern day. Because as we all know, you know, everyone's got, we've all got phones. Come on, let's get real people. We all got phones, you know. <laughs> Um, as Weird Al says in that one song, uh, we've all got cell phones, so come on, let's get real. Um, he does have a song oh, called... I'm... Yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not aware of... For those who don't know, we- Weird Al Yankovic has a song called We All Have Cell Phones, So Come On, Let's Get Real. <laughs> it's, it's really good. <clears throat> but we all have cell phones, and they all have really, 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 really good cameras in them. Like, really crazy good 4K, ultra butt blast and good cameras like iphones the newest iphones probably got something where you could photograph like i don't know the moon's taint or something from inside your bathroom and it would be fine it's wild <laughs> i my brain was reaching for some <laughs> something weird to take a picture of my brain said you could photograph a freckle on a taint and i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why we both went taint I guess it's I don't it's know. a small, hard to visualize area. <laughs> yeah, I guess. The hardest to see your own. <laughs> Film photography is one of those things where oftentimes it's been associated with hipsters, with people that are like into things that are like, like, I mean, hipsters, I feel like kind of sums it up a lot. But also I feel like people who have an appreciation for mechanical devices, you know what I mean? People who yeah, ha- yeah f- people have ha- who have an appreciation for things that work very well and will last just about forever, but are still complex and interesting and satisfying to use because of their complexity. Does that make sense? Yes. I feel like film is one of those things. Film photography is one of those things that will never truly go away, um, and we've seen a huge resurgence of it just because of how how, how many just incredibly well-made cameras there were during the height of film and how many of those are now being passed on to younger generations from their parents, um, which is exactly what happened to me. That's how I got into film photography, in fact. Starting kind of at the beginning of all of this, how does film work? We've all probably seen little rolls of film, the little film canisters. A lot of times people will keep you know, sewing needles or beads or what have you in them, um, stacks, cocaine stacks of quarters fit perfectly in there. But the the actual film canisters, sorry, weed, weed, absolutely. Weed can go at a film canister. There's so many, it's a very useful size of canister. It's like smaller than a medicine bottle, but without the safety cap. So it's my mom had a really cursed film canister in her underwear drawer full of my baby teeth for a while. So Yeah, it's a very. If that tells you, if that tells you <laughs> my age, there you go. It's a it's a good size container to have, and I could talk about film canisters for a while. But but th- the film itself, when we think of film, we often will think of those little film canisters, um, and those are actually thirty five millimeter film canisters. That's a specific size of film, and there are so many different kinds of film out there. And when we talk about film, 
oftentimes there's a whole lot of terminology involved when you get into like the science of how film works. You probably recall a lot of that from my episode where I talked about color photography. That would be mini dumps number one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, mini dumps number one. In case you haven't heard that, I want to go over just kind of the basic structure of film. When you look at film, there's basically three layers, right? On the bottom, you have the protective back coat, which could be made of a whole bunch of different things, really. Oftentimes, it'll be like a plastic or a celluloid or something like that. But that is basically to make it easy to physically handle without ruining it. On top of that, you have the celluloid base. And actually, it's not even celluloid anymore. That was actually phased out in the mid 20th century because of its flammability or inflammability, which, by the way, mean the same thing I found out during the research for this episode. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Linguist says what? Flammability and inflammability are synonyms. All right, I'm going to go on a little etymology journey <laughs> later. Yeah, yeah, I found that out. That sent me was, off, that that me off me on an etymology journey later. I, that's, I need to figure out how that happened. Anyway, yeah, I, No, same. I, I, I was reading this article talking about how film works and going through it. And it basically says the word film itself is, is accurate, even though there's a lot of terminology and misnomers in film. Film is literally a strip of plastic backing coated with a film of chemicals. Even if that plastic is not celluloid, even though people still refer to them as celluloid, uh, the chemicals are not an emulsion, even though people still refer to them as an emulsion. You'll often hear people talk about film and say, oh, this film is the same emulsion as that film. What they're saying is the actual light reactive chemicals that are on the film are identical, made in the same factory, applied in the same way. They're the same. It's effectively saying same film. Even though, though the package may look different, the canister may look different, if it's the same... It's like it's like store brand cereal. Yeah, It's exactly. got all the same ingredients. It's basically the same thing. Exactly. And in this case, it is chemically the same thing. To talk about even more misnomers, right? So people call it an emulsion. It is not an emulsion because if you if you know an emulsion, it would be two liquids that don't normally mix together, having been mixed forcibly together think of like oil and water if you shake that enough you'll get an emulsion that will eventually separate and you would normally put in a binder of some sort in order to keep that from an separating emul an emulsifier an emulsifier exactly if you have oil and water and you emulsify it you end up with an emulsion if you have a solid and a liquid and you mix those together and you you do an emulsifier and you mix them all together. That is not an emulsion. That is a suspension because you have suspended something in a liquid. In the case of film, you will have silver halide crystals, which is a specific formulation of silver. Those silver halide crystals have been suspended in traditionally what is gelatin, which is kind of sucks. But there's also other things and other ways that they suspend it. It is a suspension, not an emulsion. So there's tons of misnomers throughout it. That's interesting that my chemistry knowledge from cosmetic chemistry is coming in handy here because oh, talking about talking about skincare stuff, there's emulsifiers and there are certain things like if you have an azelaic acid product, azelaic acid only comes in a powder. So every azelaic acid cream you have is actually a suspension of that powder within this fatty base or gel base. So yeah, yeah. it's just interesting. Chemistry is cool. Chemistry is cool. I, ironically, I learned a lot about uh, emulsification and mixing things when I worked at Starbucks uh, because... Oh, there yeah. Were, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There were so many drinks that people requested and they would say, I want this and this and this and this. And I go, that won't work. And they go, how do you know? You haven't tried it. And I go, it won't work because there's no emulsifier. You've you've done nothing to make these things stick together. Therefore, they're going to separate. It's going to be weird chonky. If, yeah. yeah. You're going to have layers like an onion. We have the basic structure of film. It has the silver halide suspension on top. This suspension is very, very light sensitive. And as we expose it to light, it will basically turn the silver halide from its current state as silver halide. And where the light hits it, it becomes tiny specks of actual metallic silver. This is actually known as the latent image so it is the actual image that is on the film negative so the dark spots on the film are the spots where you have silver halide and the light spots on the film are the spots where you have actual metallic silver 
which I think is really cool. Oh. Yeah. And that's how black and white photography works. Now, obviously, color photography, much more complicated. When you are taking black and white photos, essentially, you are just taking silver in a specific light reactive form. And you are saying, I'm going to expose light to it. And so when the photons hit that silver halide, the ones that get hit with light that's reflected from whatever you're photographing, they change. They change state from silver halide to metallic silver. an imprint of how the light was hitting it at that moment in time. Exactly, yeah. Now, obviously, when light is... When we're looking at things, right, when light hits our eyes, there's all sorts of things that are going on. Everything that you... If you look around right now, everything that you are able to see... Everything the light (laughs) touches is yours, Mufasa. (laughs) Yes, everything that light touches is reflecting light back oh, sorry, at you. Sorry, Simba. Why did I say Mufasa? Anyway, why did you say that? <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking, do a Mufasa voice, and I said, <laughs> you can't. You can't be James Earl Jones. Do your best. And then my brain was thinking Mufasa. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> what was I talking about? I lost my train of thought. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Everything the light touches. You're You're talking about visible. You're talking about visible light. Visible light. Yeah, yeah. So when you look around your room or your car, wherever you're listening to this, everything that you can see is reflecting light back at your eyes. Everything you can see is reflecting light back at your eyes. Lighter colored things are reflecting more light back at you, and that is how a black and white film is able to kind of delineate between. Even though if you take a photo of someone, right, and they they have dark hair and light skin, it's going to get more light from the light bouncing off of the light skin than the dark hair. And that's how the the silver halide gets less affected on the part of the image that is receiving photons from the dark hair. Now, there is still photons coming from that dark hair, which is why you only expose the film for a fraction of a second. Yeah, because different intensity of light, depending on is it direct, is it being refracted, which is one of the reasons that it really bothers me in media with vampires, when a vampire is like, I'll be fine if I'm just hanging out in the shade. And it's like, buddy, you got UV bouncing directly back up at you from everything around you. I can see you out there. If I can see you out there, the sunlight is touching you. Exactly. Yeah. It's so hard to justify vampires being anywhere but in a coffin during the day. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because yeah. like, Buffy. I, like looking right now, my curtains in my room are closed, and yet I know there is light coming in through there. So like, yeah, if I yeah. was a vampire, I'd have like a nasty sunburn at least. At so, a yeah, minimum. But at anyway. a minimum. Anyway, obviously things are a lot more complicated with color film. But where am I going with all of this? Why does this matter? Nowadays, our cameras don't have to worry about any of that. It doesn't have to worry about the emulsion and the gelatin and the a fraction of a second exposure and exactly how long to expose it so you don't overexpose or underexpose. By the way, that's where the term exposure comes from. Literally, how long have you exposed the film to light? So we don't have to worry about all of that nowadays with our fancy phone cameras and all of that and our digital cameras and our, our DSLRs and our, you know, I'm sure you've seen some, like, if you've watched football, you've probably seen some dude carrying like a 30 pound lens with a two pound camera attached to it. And it's that all was digital. In, in high school for the high school newspaper, that was one of James's jobs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those big ass lenses, they get really big. And those are what are called what's called a telephoto lens, which basically just means it it has a like the amount of what it is taking a picture of is much, much smaller than what human vision is. It, that's essentially the definition of a telephoto lens. It's just it is the, the the field of view is smaller than a human field of view. I think there's another term for if it's larger than at a certain point, it becomes what's called a fisheye lens, which you're all familiar with. We have these fancy, fancy cameras in our phones. There is something about the removal of the thought and the care that goes into knowing, all right, how how wide open do I need to set the aperture on the camera? How fast or how much exposure do I need to set? Knowing how to set all of those things so that you are capturing a very specific amount of amount of photons i don't know something about that process to me it feels like i'm interacting with the world in a different way than when i just take a snap a picture on my camera there's a a, a yeah, removal an of intention so, yeah an intention and I, I i don't know if i have the the words for it but something about 
like when when you have a film camera you have to also advance the film you have to move it to the next frame of the film the the process of doing that with a camera that is like a manual film camera something about that just feels good like there's a you know a a, 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 a ratcheting you know if you've ever played with like a, like a, a wrench a ratcheting wrench or something like that and it makes that satisfying you know tick 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 noise as it rotates around it's kind of like that and you can you you feel the film advancing through and i don't know there's a tactile like stimmy nature to it that i really 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 like and also oh yeah yeah you're yeah i i completely agree like i i feel like an old lady a lot of the time because i like to do i mean my friends joke that i have old lady hobbies but i do have old lady hobbies and there's something about doing things with intention and then having to do it with my hands Mm -hmm. and deliberately doing that stuff that I really like. That's why I'm I'm hand sewing a jacket right now, a patchwork jacket, because there's something really just rewarding about the process. And could I use a sewing machine to do a lot of what I'm doing? Absolutely. I would have been done by now. I would have had a full jacket, but doing something tactile that's extremely rewarding and i also think there's an element so you let me take one of your cameras with me when i went to amsterdam with james several years Mm -hmm. ago and i told myself okay well i love photography just for background i i've been very into it since i was a, a kid and i just haven't picked it up lately i think phones make that more difficult and having like a separate camera thing makes me less likely to take a picture and then doom scroll so i wanted to get back to that and you let me take one of your film cameras with me and i told myself that i would use that to take my pictures and not get my phone out and be very (laughs) deliberate about what i'm taking pictures of and not feel beholden to take a certain number and like not have my phone out and there was something about telling myself okay stop and enjoy this thing you're taking a picture of yeah yeah. Take time to figure out the best angles to capture this. And I ended up with some really great pictures that I I don't think I could have gotten using my phone. Absolutely. Yeah, honestly, some of the pictures that you took on that little camera that I loaned you, I think I, I, I have the camera actually right in front of me. I forget what brand it is, but it's like a, a Fujifilm little point and shoot film camera. Very basic. I, yeah. I, yeah. There's no zoom. There's no zoom on it or anything. You... It is Mm -hmm. essentially has the functions of one of those disposable cameras, but in a non-disposable form. You point, you click, you take the picture. It's that's it. Yeah, it is a a rectangle. What take picture? (laughs) It it has (laughs) it has a flash on it, but honestly, the flash doesn't always work. And I I got it for like I think twenty bucks at a camera shop. I was like, that's a cute little camera. And honestly, I think only the only thing I would have done in hindsight if I if I could do that again would be to load you a better camera, just because some of the photos that you took didn't come out super great. Not because no, of any, just because yeah. just because of the quality of the camera, really, and the inability of the the film to capture what you were taking a picture. Because I of. couldn't adjust things. There's no adjusting yeah, things like exactly. shutter speed. There's no adjusting any of that. Mm-hmm. There's no auto. I, it it doesn't really have an autofocus. It's just kind of a wide open focus where it tries to get everything in focus. And but it was but fun. still very fun and you and i have had dates where we take your cameras out and go take pictures like going to white rock lake and stuff and like yeah no i'm all that to say i love film cameras and it helps me disconnect from my phone and actually just go enjoy taking pictures of things exactly one of the things that i found with film photography is that when i take a picture on my phone the likelihood that i'm going to go back and look at that picture realistically not very high um, and so those memories just kind of sit in my phone and I've got pictures going back to like, not even going to lie, like 2009 in my Google photos, like store that I barely ever look at or glance at. When you take pictures with film, there is something like suspenseful. Like you don't get to see the pictures right yeah. away. You have to look on your own first and, and experience what you're seeing in order to take that film photo and how that picture comes out you know, when you finally get the film developed later, you sit down and you look at the pictures and you you go back to those memories much later on. And that is something that is so much fun for me. It's just the ability to sit down and be like, all right, let me see how these pictures came out from from that trip, which is 
it's such a rewarding experience, especially if you get prints. Like, oh my gosh, I I got I think four rolls of film or three or four rolls of film developed the other day, and we sat down on the couch and we're just going through them. And like every time we'd get to a really good picture of a dog, we'd go, oh, and it's yeah. just, it's just if it's that is one of the best parts of film photography, in my opinion. It's you are going to look at the pictures again once you get them developed, and it'll take you back to that moment in a way that phone pictures really can't. Because, like, how many times have you, you know, been hanging out with someone and like, oh, I just got back from my trip from Bora Bora. Do you want to see the pictures? And just the thought of someone leaning over and showing me their phone and, like, awkwardly dragging their finger along while pointing it away oh, from them. And I'm, and I'm never going <laughs> to do that to someone else. I'm afraid I'm going to swipe too far and they're going to see some stuff. Exactly. Like... Our phones and that are sounds like, like I, that sounds like I'm taking a bunch of pictures of my butt, which I'm not. There's probably just some very cursed screenshots I've taken. Right, right, same. I and like, there are two ways to share someone share with someone photos that you took on your phone. Realistically, you can turn your phone, which is not meant to really show other people things. That's not really what the phone is for. It's it's a for you type of thing, or you can send them the pictures through email or text or whatever. But then there's, you know, compression issues. Then it feels kind of like a task somehow or like, all right, let me get let me get into my email and like find this email that you sent with the pictures attached or let me get into my Google Drive because there's a size limit. There's so many like weird little barriers to entry to just showing someone pictures on your phone that makes it feel like way too difficult. And and I have some really great memories of being a teenager and being like, Okay, I here I'm gonna go get all of the film developed from the spring break trip to Spain, and then you like get your pictures, and you're like, <laughs> yeah, and you're like looking through all of them after. That's something very rewarding. Like that used to be a thing, where it's like, oh, I got my film developed from you know junior senior. Let me go through and see you know all of the pics I took. Exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad that there is. There's kind of a permanent resurgence of film, I feel like. I feel like once we got to the digital age and everyone has an iPhone with a, with a camera in it, film dipped. Film definitely went out of fashion for quite a while. And then it came back. And now we have a much stronger appreciation for not just film photography, but how well made those freaking cameras were. Oh my gosh. There are so many old cameras from the 40s 50s 60s that are like selling for thousands of dollars because this is like they are better than any film cameras you can buy today <laughs> and they're just they have a unique look to them they have a unique style there are some films and camera combinations that are so iconic that you can look at a photo if you if you are really like into film photography you can look and say oh that's a Leica one 100% that's a Leica one on Kodak gold film or something like that phone cameras don't have that there's so much that really goes into film that cannot be replicated with filters on your phone or something like that and there's apps that try to mimic the the look of film I feel like that kind of defeats the purpose it's it, it and it also there's something about it it's just not quite right yeah it's like when you look at like if someone's trying to like make a, a Blair Witch parody or something like that but it's not actually on like VHS recordings or whatever it just doesn't look quite right it's the same way when you go back and look at old movies and it was originally you know or like old tv shows that were not originally in ultra hd and you're looking at them in hd and you're like god this looks like shit okay <laughs> buffy, buffy buffy when they updated buffy and i'm yeah. like i can see not only can i tell when you switched out the stunt double i could see a freckle on their taint <laughs> right exactly it's <laughs> i was not meant to see this <laughs> exactly yeah so there's something about a purposeful kind of loss of quality i say in big quotes around quality a permanent change in the pre presentation of an image that is so interesting to me and kind of like how pixel art i think it's also i was gonna say i think it's also the difference between like photorealistic visual yeah. art that you create with like paint or digitally versus stylized where for me personally, I would rather have the stylized mm -hmm. thing that looks like less of a high quality reproduction of a dog or exactly. something 
than a photorealistic picture of a dog. You yeah. know what I mean? Like photorealism has its place, but more often I want the one that's got a little stank yeah, on it. I, I have a, a, a kind of a, a motto sort of in my head when it comes to art in general, which is like, how rare is it that the essence of something can be captured by a photo of it? You know, that is such very rarely the case. I find that just a perfect representation of a thing captures its essence and like the vibe of a thing. I don't know. You took that picture of me that we got back recently where I'm making a stink face while I'm brushing my teeth. That was um, film. That's on film. That was that was film. I know, but I'm saying I feel like that probably captured my essence pretty well. I think well. it did. And I think part of that had to do with the fact that it wasn't just a random snap on the camera or on the phone camera, you know. I feel like that adds something to it. And the specific film that I used is one that makes the red in your hair and the, on your cheeks and stuff stand out and it kind of desaturates the background some and it it highlights you as the focus of that picture. The film wins again. Film wins every time. Now, to film that's extra good at photographing stinky subjects. Exactly, such as yourself. Uh, yeah. I love you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, I I'd like to kind of I I've done a bunch of research on, you know, why film is kind of coming back in and the process that people are going through to get back into film because obviously going from, you know, iPad kids, you know, whipping their phone up and tapping on a white circle to capture a photo there's a learning process that comes with taking film photography. It is it is a, a hobby. You have to learn how to do it. So I have this article from Arizona State University talking about the resurgence of film photography. Uh, and there is a student named Adam Ruiz who decides to buy a film camera on a whim. And this article, by the way, is by a person named Leah Mesquita, M-E-S-Q-U-I-T-A, which is a cool name. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that's really yeah, cool. Leah Mosquito sounds like a superhero. It sounds like a superhero's real yeah, name. Yeah, it really does. This article says when when Aiden Ruiz decided to buy a film camera on a whim, he didn't expect the used Nikon with a broken autofocus would ignite a passion for photography. After acquiring the camera in a meeting with the seller, the senior studying finance threw in a 36 photo roll and f- proceeded to shoot all of it on campus. What he captured could only be described as horrendous, Ruiz said. <laughs> My experience <laughs> was very similar. The first, like, four or five rolls of stuff that I shot on my dad's old camera that he gave me, which by the way is a Minolta XGM. Absolutely beautiful camera. My dad got it in the 70s or, or 80s, some point in there. And then he took so many cool photos of him, like with his motorcycle riding in the mountains, all kinds of cool stuff. But I then got this camera, just took a bunch of shit photos with it, got them developed and they stuck with it. And And why did they stick with it? That's the thing, right? I I did the same thing and I stuck with it. And the thing that that I found really interesting was like, I failed at taking good film photographies, but the process was so viscerally enjoyable that I wanted to do it again. That is something that is really hard to find. It's a beautiful thing. Looking later on in the article, they are talking about how later on they got a 65-year-old Mamiya RB67 camera and they still own that camera today they shoot with it every weekend even though today's generation lives in a digital world where iphones can capture videos in 4k cinematic mode with just the tap of a finger and cutting edge cameras can operate at 120 frames per second many are still running to ebay and thrift stores in search of old film cameras and that is really really cool like my minolta xgm it is completely functional the only thing is that the light meter is a little unreliable at times and it is a little finicky and i have a light meter app on my phone basically just to help me measure the amount of light coming in but other than that it is like a well-oiled machine and has seen zero maintenance since my dad bought it in 1975 or whatever by their own nature they need to be kind of self-encapsulated so that you don't get light coming in and leaking onto the film they need to keep dust out all of these things and that all of that together and the fact that you have a solid steel or aluminum body all metal parts on everything and it's it all needs to be well made because you have moving parts that need to be held very precisely these things last forever and you know obviously they'll have problems sometimes but there are still shops that will do film camera repairs and things like that and the results that you can get from film cameras nowadays are truly unique and the best example of that 
is from a company called Lamography. And that is technically where I first got into film photography. Because before my dad gave me his old film camera, I was at a little shop. Like, I think it was a thrift store or something with a friend. And I happened to see a little display of these. They were called simple use cameras. The idea is that it's a disposable camera style camera, but with the ability to open it up and put a new roll of film in it. And I I saw that and I was like, that is such a cool idea. I really like the idea of that. I don't know much about film photography, but this is simple to use and it's not just going to go straight in the trash. So I like that. I'm going to get one of these. And it was 20 bucks and it came with a roll of film inside. And I bought the the camera and a second roll of film just to kind of give it a try. Total was like $30, I think. I took those two rolls of film. And the thing about Lamography is that they're all about the experimental side of film photography, about capturing what you can't do on a iPhone, capturing the things that you simply cannot capture with a digital camera. Things like double exposures, where you take a photo advance the film, and then reverse it to take another photo on top of that same photo. So you have two photos on the same image, and it has like a kind of a ghostly effect to it where you have, you know, you could take a picture of flowers and then take someone's portrait. And now you have a beautiful portrait overlaid with flowers in the background. That is something you just can't do on a phone without like an hour in Photoshop, you know? And the ability to do that in a purely mechanical physical medium is awesome and they're actually taking it a step further in a lot of ways if you go to lamography's website they have a whole series of classic style cameras that basically replicate the types of cameras that are kind of getting a little bit harder to find nowadays just you know because of the resurgence they have something called the diana f plus which is like just a very simple straightforward 35 millimeter camera simple lens you can swap it out with other lenses that they sell it's got a flash like it's very straight it's like a step up from their simple use camera and then you can take a step up even from there to something like the lomo lubitel 166 plus now that is a wild camera there's a classic russian twin lens camera that can use both 120 millimeter film and 35 millimeter film And this, yeah, this is a recreation of that for modern day. Yeah. So it's literally got a 35 millimeter lens and a 120 millimeter lens for you to use like interchangeably. You could take one and then the other and just like kind of just go crazy with it. They also do like point and shoot instant print type of cameras. What do they, what do they call those when you just take a photo and it prints it right out? A Polaroid? Polaroid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Polaroid. They have Polaroid style cameras uh, that use like common Fujifilm photo paper. They also have stuff that's like really experimental, which I think is really cool. Um, They have something called the Sprocket Rocket, which I really (laughs) want to get one. The Sprocket Rocket. Yeah. So think about film, right? You've got that little square. That's your frame. But the entire film is coated in that light reactive material, right? Even the sprockets that advance the film forward in the camera, that's covered in that same material, the same silver halide and everything. Mm -hmm. So why not use that as part of the picture? So the sprocket rocket, yeah, the sprocket rocket basically is a panoramic wide angle lens that takes a picture across both three frames of 35 millimeter film and the sprockets on the top and bottom of those frames. Yeah. So you literally get this really big panoramic picture and it includes the beautiful shaping of these sprockets in the photo which is really really freaking cool and they do some other stuff that i think is really neat to to kind of even expand on that they have the spinner 360 this is a 35 millimeter film camera for taking 360 degree panorama shots whoa it literally has a fucking beyblade ripcord on it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're going nuts over here at Lamography. They put a Beyblade ripcord on a camera <laughs> and you fucking pull the string and it whips the camera around with the shutter open grip across. It it. You grip it and rip it. I want one of these things so bad. And the best part about all this, they're they're out of stock at the moment, but a Spinner 360, 50 bucks. Oh, 50 wow. bucks for their fucking Beyblade camera. Ah. 
um, and like they have how much examples. how much is the how much is the battle arena for the cameras oh my god i <laughs> i don't even know but they also have stuff like a, a pinhole style camera it's a whole other thing pinhole photography where you're only allowing one little strip of light basically they have something called the action sampler where you can take one frame of film and take four sequential images, one in each corner of the frame. So it's like like a four panel f- comic. Yeah, you take a photo in the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, and then you move to the next frame. <laughs> okay, but the implications for that would be really funny for doing like a four panel comic. Absolutely, like the way like, you could add the applications for that are that would be very fun. Someone could have a lot absolutely. of fun with that. Yeah, there's so much fun. And that that action sampler, it's the cool like nine they have the it's an action sampler clear. So it's like that cool translucent plastic where you can see all the stuff inside. Yeah. It's forty bucks. Forty bucks for this really cool fucking thirty five millimeter camera. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. They also have to e- go even further, they have something called a Lomo Kino, which basically takes thirty five millimeter film, which by the way, I'm going to get into this here in just a minute, a little bit of a history of it, 35 millimeter film, which is literally cinematic film. You have a hundred foot roll of 35 millimeter film for making a a movie. It takes that up to 144 frames of it. And you can, it's literally a little 35 millimeter cinematography camera. Oh, cool. Made for modern day. Yeah. Uh, up to 144 frames, which is just a few seconds of film, basically. But it you can do some really cool stuff with that. 35 millimeter film is most of what I'm talking about right now. There are other types of film that are also popular. There's 120 millimeter film. There's 110 millimeter film. There's a few other types that are kind of like there's slide films and things like that that are somewhat common. But really, the big top three are 35 millimeter by a long shot, and then 120 and 110 film. Those are basically like really long, skinny little frames, basically, where you have a much wider frame. So you you can kind of get wider individual pictures with stuff. So it's interesting. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that. But 35 millimeter is just so functional, and it's so prevailing. It's just what people use for everything nowadays, basically. But originally, 35 millimeter was a film photography format. It was not for still pictures at all. It was it wasn't intended from that from the get go. 35 millimeter film. That is the popular name for it. But Kodak actually coined a standard like terminology for different sizes of film. And 135 film is specifically the term for photography use 35 millimeter film. So if you say 35 millimeter film, technically that's you're talking sick. about Movies. that's. Ex- that's for movies right but also you are technically correct (laughs) even on the you know modern day film they put 35 millimeter because every that's just the colloquialism basically the term 135 was introduced by kodak in 1934 as a designation for 35 millimeter film for photos specifically but the actual first time that it was used for a camera was many 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 years back so the first small format camera to use this 35 millimeter cinematography film was actually the Sont Views, uh, which is a French word meaning hundred views. Uh, and it was invented in 1909 by the Frenchman Etienne Molière, um, who was a, an inventor uh, and like a very prolific inventor, invented a lot of things relating to cameras and shutters and how all of these things work. And this Sont Views basically you would take a 100 frame roll of 35 millimeter film, kind of squish it into a rectangle and put it into this uh, this little camera. And oddly enough, the very first 35 millimeter camera, you held it vertically. The viewfinder finder was on the short end. And oh, so cool. you held it up. Yeah, and which ironically is like a cell phone <laughs> yeah it's it took photos in the same format that we now do with our cell phones the That's very first funny. one and is the second edition of this sont views camera immediately sideways views from there but i think it's so funny that technically the first 35 millimeter film camera vertical 
vertical, which is just so, such an odd choice. The Sont views, a lot of people probably don't really know about it because it wasn't the thing that popularized 35 millimeter film for photography. It was interrupted due to a lack of resources because, oh no, First World War was happening. But there's a French inventing competition called Concours Lepin that happens every year in France. Uh, and it is an annual competition still going on to this day for inventors. It's literally like a French inventors fair. Um, and I could do a whole episode about that. It's a really cool thing. But it won the gold medal in 1910 for that inventors competition. Fast forward just a little bit. We see a company that makes microscopes. Even before this little film camera was made, you have a company that was making microscopes. In 1847, we had the foundation of Spencer Lens slash American Optical Instruments in the USA. And this company would go on to continue making microscopes and optical devices of all sorts, but primarily microscopes, all the way to like around 1913, where they first presented a binocular microscope. I don't really know what that is. It's kind of outside of the scope of this episode, but apparently that's when that happened. But in 1914, they popped off. They went a little crazy and they released their own, this microscope company, 35 millimeter, small format camera called the Leica, L-E-I-C-A. And it was invented by Oscar Barnack. Now, They hadn't really done a whole lot with cameras before outside of just the optics of the cameras. Oscar Barnack, he was a German inventor and a photographer who built this camera, basically. And he did some like independent testing. And the cameras, he made, I think, only like three or four of these like test cameras that will use this 35 millimeter film. And I'm pretty sure that he based his design off of that Sont Views, like essentially camera it's called the the Ur Leica, like you are like the predecessor to the Leica. Um, And even to this day, the Leica one camera is considered like one of the best film cameras historically. It's just such an incredibly good camera. The quote unquote Ur Leica, which is like the predecessor to the Leica one, which would become one of the, the, the cameras that popularized 35 millimeter as a photography format. It was designed by Oscar Barnack, announced in 1924, but he actually carried it all the way from around, I think, 1910 or 1914. I found some conflicting information on that. And he he took photographs with it all the way up until it was released in 1924. And we have evidence of some really interesting photographs that he took from things like a flood that happened in Germany in 1920. He has photographs on 35 millimeter film from this wow. flood that he took on this proto Leica one camera, which I think is really, really neat. He announced the camera in 1924 and the Leica one began to be sold in 1925. It was an immediate success and is almost solely responsible for popularizing 35 millimeter film photography, which I think is really, really cool. So in 1925, the camera, the Leica one, was submitted at the Spring Fair of Leipzig, and it was just immediate success. People were so taken aback by the quality of the photos that you could get from it and the portability of it, how small it was. And the first run of them, the uh, Leica one, it was only like 31 uh, pre-production cameras, basically. Um, Yeah, so the the prototypes themselves had a mixed reception, but the actual Leica one was like a huge hit. So I'm just imagining how much one of those prototypes goes for if someone still has them. I can actually tell you, I think. Give me just a moment. <laughs> oh my god. So I found here an auction listing. Um a one of the original thirty one prototypes for the the uh the camera, sometimes called the lights camera. Uh, Leica is kind of an acronym uh, of 200... lights. Okay, I want to do a Price is Right. Can I do a Price is Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your guess? And I'll, let me clarify. This is this condition is rated a B plus from 2018. Okay, and this sale. sold. This sold. Mm-hmm. Was the mm-hmm. auction done through an auction house? Uh, I believe so. 
Let me see. Yes, it was. I think it was done through Christie's, potentially. Okay, I'm going to say $400,000. Oh, actually, just to clarify, it's actually Westlicht Auction, which is a German auction company. That's fine. That's right. fine. I'm going to say, well, we're talking about euros, then, because a German auction. Well, the, the price that I'm seeing is in, in dollars. Okay, 400000 US dollars. You are not even close. Really? Yeah. This B plus condition, uh, Ur Leica prototype lights camera sold for two hundred, uh, sorry, two million six hundred eighty eight thousand dollars. So I'm just a little bit off. <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> off. Now there was one in B minus condition in two thousand seven that was sold for about uh five hundred and sixty thousand dollars i don't know but what... the price has gone up since then significantly if you could give me these <laughs> i wish they graded it like comic books because me b plus b minus i'm like i have no bearing for what that means for the condition yeah. but yeah that's amazing yeah th essentially the condition would mean it has clearly been used i think but not like damaged and it's still functional which is wild still fully functional and if you look at if you look up a picture of a leica one prototype it's basically just, it, it doesn't look too crazy because pretty much every camera, like 35 millimeter camera that came after that is just kind of a revision of this, which I think is really amazing. It's just a black rectangle with like that leatherette coating around it. You've got all of the silver buttons on top and you've got the lens on the front with a little metal kind of uh, lens part. The lens is interchangeable, which was like, kind of a, a newer thing here it looks like oh yeah that's an old film camera it is the old film camera <laughs> which i think is really yeah cool. yeah if it ain't broke don't fix it when we talk about photography we can go back even further though uh one thing i want to talk about too is daguerreotypes are you familiar with those yes so uh, daguerreotypes were invented by louis daguerre i believe that's how you say it um and introduced worldwide in one of the dugger kids <laughs> one of the dugger kids yep <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this Duggar kid, uh, so interestingly enough, a daguerreotype is the name of an image created through the process of daguerreotype. Yes. So you you daguerreotype a daguerreotype, <laughs> which I think is really funny. Essentially, to make an image with daguerreotype, a daguerreotypist, which is the name for someone who takes these photos, takes a polished sheet of silver plated copper and they, they have it shined to a mirror finish. And then they treat it with fumes that make its surface light sensitive. It just kind of like the silver halide in traditional modern photography. And they exposed that, uh, that, that plate in a camera for as long as was judged to be necessary to get the proper image, which could be, depending on what you were capturing, as little as a few seconds for brightly uh, sunlit subjects, or much longer with less intense lighting, uh, which could be like, you know, up to a few minutes sometimes, which could be really tough for people. And the latent image, the result of that latent image was visible by fuming it with mercury vapor. Oh. Super safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they had tons of safe equipment and, and hoods and everything for that. Um, for sure, for sure. But, they didn't just raw dog it and handle it with their bare hands and stuff. Oh, yeah, definitely not. But that mercury vapor <laughs> removed its sensitivity to light by its a, a liquid chemical treatment, essentially. They rinsed it and dried it, and then they sealed the, the result, which if you ha have a daguerreotype and it's not sealed behind glass... You could touch it and it would just wipe off like a, a fine powder on a on a desktop. The the image, which is protected by glass, fun fact about daguerreotypes, is actually you can see the negative just by tilting it. When you look straight on, you see yeah, the positive yeah, yeah, image. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah. there's a God, what museum was it that had a thing where there's a daguerreotype and you did a thing and it would tilt it to show you that. I think it was yeah. a museum back in Dallas. I remember I remember learning about daguerreotypes through that and then tilting and going, whoa. Yeah. I just think that's really neat. And like something that I didn't know about until I started doing research for this episode, because whenever you see a daguerreotype in a textbook or on your phone or on the line or whatever, it's just like an old picture. Like, yeah. There's no appreciation for the physical format, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I forget um, what museum that was, but it was incredibly like small, like smaller than I expected. And then like, yeah. It does it when you yeah. look at it in books, it looks just like a picture, but I'm like, no, it's this little thing in glass. Exactly, yeah. Even since 
uh, you know, the Renaissance era, going back before daguerreotypes, artists and inventors and creative types of, of all sorts would ha have searched for various mechanical methods of capturing visual scenes without having to like literally paint them and involve kind of that human error process. Are you familiar with the term camera obscura? Yes. Okay. So a camera obscura is literally where you have a darkened room with a small, small hole that is letting light in. And because of the way that light moves and the way that light works, it would project into that room, a, assuming it's brightly lit enough outside, a reversed image of what is outside onto the wall of that darkened room. And even in, you know, the 17th century, we had, there was Italian physicist and chemist Angelo Sala, who wrote that powdered silver nitrate was blackened by the sun, but he didn't find any practical application for the phenomenon, <laughs> which in hindsight, in hindsight, is like, come on, that man. That can't be important. Whatever. Come on. Yeah. Wow. That's wild, but. <laughs> cool. I okay. I don't know what to do with that. Some weird mold um, on my orange. <laughs> should just exactly. toss that out. Exactly. Yeah. The, there was also, you know, discoveries of other photosensitive uh, substances, silver nitrate by Albertus Magnus in the 13th century, a silver and chalk light sensitive mixture by Johann Schultz in 1724. And there's a bitumen based heliography thing. It's a, a whole thing. What? Uh, but bitumen. <laughs> so bitumen is basically a very viscous part of petroleum, from what I understand. I, I don't. It's basically like petroleum tar, I think. It sounds like you're saying bitchy man in a funny voice. It's it's B I T U M E N bitumen. It's, bitumen. It's like, bitumen. Bitumen. It's, so I'm I was getting too much of the ch out of it. That's interesting. Bitumen. So yeah, so the U.S. pronunciation is bit, bitumen, and the British pronunciation is bitumen. Bitumium, like they do aluminium. <laughs> bitumen. Yeah, the, the U.S. pronunciation just f puts the focus on the chew rather than the bitch. Bitch. <laughs> bitchman. Which, oh my God, that'd be a good name for a D&D &D character, bitchman. Bitchman. <laughs> Hi, I'm bitchman button. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So bitchman apparently is the material commonly known in American English as asphalt. I just found out. Oh. So bitchman is asphalt, which comes from the Greek word asphaltos which refers to natural bitumen or pitch. So apparently... So uh, Canadians that... who like to say asphalt, go look at how it's spelled. Go look at the origin word. It's asphalt. And you roasted me for saying asphalt in college, and you thought I was being a weird American, but there's no H after... It's not ash. It's a PH for a F. Yeah. Anyway... They roasted me because I'm like, oh, they're laying asphalt over on this road. And they're like, asphalt, asphalt, dumb American. And I was like, baby, look at how it's spelled. And they're like, oh. Exactly. But yeah, so in 1822, there was found to be a way to use bitumen to take photos or, or do art, art with it, basically. And that all of those inventions, the silver nitrate, silver and chalk mixture, bitumen, all of that contributed to the development of the daguerreotype, which was the first one that really was popularized for quite some time. All of this, you know, we, we've got film cameras now that are uh, the good compromise. You know, it's not daguerreotypes. It's easy enough to use that you can learn it in a few rolls of film. And it is tactile enough that it still feels like you are connecting with your subject and with your photos in a really interesting way. But I, I will still hear, hear people say things like, you know, well, just get a digital camera not and stuff same. like that. It's not the same, right? Um, and I feel like a lot of people who start out doing photography with digital photos don't really understand the desire to try film photography and a lot of people that get into digital photography start out on digital photography using a dslr which is a digital single lens reflex camera basically a camera that has a mirror to show you the viewfinder and then that moves out of the way momentarily when you press the shutter people that use these digital cameras they will get results as a beginner that are very 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 similar 
to just using a phone. Yeah. And I was able to see a lot of discussion online about people saying, what's even the point of DSLR cameras anymore? I can just use my phone and get a better image. But what they're missing is that level of control. And I feel like if they just started with film, they would not only have a better understanding of what control they have with a DSLR camera, but also they might just stick with film, <laughs> honestly. Yes. Uh, yeah, they, I think they run into a bit of a, a beginner's paradox, if that makes sense, where they see their results and they're coming up to just look like phone photographs, basically. And they're like, well, why don't I just use my phone? But what they're realizing is that it's not the camera's fault. It is their fault yeah. as a user. A they're a beginner. Of, a lack of imagination, yeah. too. Yeah. The phone, previously, when they would take phone photos, would, would do like 80% of the work for them to get as close to a professional quality image. And now they're stepping back to something that has manual controls and going, I'm doing everything right. And it just looks like my phone. Yeah. So you yeah. need to do just a little bit better. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, I feel like starting with film kind of bypasses that thought process, you know? Yeah. And for me, like, I just like that I don't have the urge to go back and look at it and go, oh, no, I can do better and delete it and take another one and go, oh, no, right. delete it and do another one. I am forced exactly. to say, okay, I've taken a few pictures of this. It is what it is. Try to move on to the next thing. And yeah, I hope that turns out hope good. That turns out good. And like some of that's a little nerve wracking, but I really like not having to have my phone out all the time. Yeah. Well, these kids these days always on, their on dang that damn phones. phone. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I'm half the time if I take a picture on my phone. I'll just tab over to Instagram and think about posting it. And then by the time I get into Instagram, it's like, oh, well, actually, I've let sent, me scroll I've for a little Brie bit. I've sent on six reels. And then I've... I've <laughs> <laughs> the photo that I took is lost forever <laughs> in, in the annals of my Google Photo archive. <laughs> if you're thinking about getting into film photography or you're just kind of curious about it, I would highly recommend go to Lamography. Get yourself one of those simple use cameras. It's like 20 bucks. They're on sale half the time. It comes with film in it. Just get the film. You don't even have to like go to a fancy camera place to get the film developed. You can actually just go to like a CVS or a Walgreens. Yes, they still develop film. They won't let you keep the negatives generally, which is a bit of a bummer. And you might need to find a local film place if you want to do that. But if you just want the photos printed out, CVS, Walgreens, whatever, your local drugstore will probably do it for you. It, it'll be like five bucks for the whole roll. So total investment, 20, 30 bucks. It's a cheap hobby to get into. It can get a little expensive if you really want the fancy stuff, but take some photos on that little disposable, not disposable camera. You know, if you like it, take some more photos, show them to your parents, and you never know. Your your dad might come back and say, hey, I've got a whole pile of old camera equipment if you want it. And it'll turn out to be a really, really nice camera set with tons of lenses. And, and you know, who knows? There's so much room in the hobby for experimentation and trying new things and it's really really cool time to get into film photography i agree and i think it's great and i think we should go have another photography date sometime soon yeah i think we i know that farmer's market nearby i'm gonna bring my camera for sure i'll oh, be taking yeah. some pictures of some real go good get veggies some delicious in-season produce and then go take some pictures yeah 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 absolutely yeah, yeah at the same time yeah no i'm gonna be finding some real red juicy tomatoes mm. for the cover for the graphing <laughs> the housekeeping section you know the first thing i'm going to say is that if you want to support mixnomer and info dumpies the best thing you can do is tell your friends about the show we don't pay for ads and we don't take paid ads and that is why you telling people about the show is so important because that's entirely how we grow that's how we grew today's lucky winner and that's how info dumpies is growing and the best most tangible thing you can do for us is tell other people about the show post about it in relevant groups if you're in a photography group, that might be a fun one to share this episode in. Yeah, so telling people about the show, that's the best way you can help us. You can also leave us a cute review to let other people know what they're getting into when they look at the show on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, Spotify, you can just do rating. 
um, which is less committal because you don't have to actually write anything, but you can give us a nice rating on Spotify. It takes like two seconds. You've already listened to the show. Um, but apart from that, if you would like to support us financially, you can also check out the show details to find the link to the Mix No More Patreon page. Tiers start at just a dollar a month, and then you get to join our Discord server and hang out with us, and like this weekend we're having another Jackbox Games night because it is such a fun group to play Jackbox games with. It's really fun. Uh, but I'm doing body doubling every single Monday now. I'm doing a fiber arts hangout every single Thursday now on the Discord server. We're doing, we had a book club last week, a comic book book club, and we talked about Saga. Just a lot of really fun stuff, and that's just for a dollar a month. Um, at other tiers, you can get bonus content from this show and today's lucky winner and any shows we create bonus content for in the future. And at certain levels, you can get a shout out like our friends Randy Lovings, Rachel Rachelson, Sewing Seraph, B. Trossler, Helen Clifford, M. Mosin, Lucy, Nicole Valdiveso, Natasha Neves, and Carl G. Brooks. If you want to see what Violet and I are up to when we are not doing podcast stuff, our social media links are in the show details. But yeah, I think that's about all I've got for you today. Uh, so until next time. Oh wait, that's the other show. I don't do that sign-off for this one. This one is Clever Sign-Off. <laughs>